Good morning and happy Easter. Happy Easter. We're so glad that you chose to celebrate this glorious Easter with us here at St. Francis by the Sea. Welcome to each of you. We have many announcements in the bulletin. Don't miss those. When it comes time for communion, the ushers will show you exactly where to go. And I'm happy to tell you this morning that we are welcoming Bishop Robert Skirving, who is the Bishop of the Eastern, the Diocese of East Carolina. He's here with us today to preach and celebrate. It's always a treat to have him here. We're glad you're here.
Alleluia. Christ is risen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, and that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, who through your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, overcame death and opened to us the gate of everlasting life, grant that we, who celebrate with joy the day of the Lord's resurrection, may be raised from the death of sin by your life giving Spirit, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first reading this morning is from Acts. Then Peter began to speak to them. I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. You know the message he sent to the people of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That message spread throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John announced how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witness to all that he did, both in Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear not to all the people, but to us who were chosen by God as witnesses and who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. The word of the Lord. Please join me in reciting Psalm 118. I'll begin each segment and ask you to join me at the asterisk. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. 
Let Israel now proclaim. The Lord is my strength and my song. And he has become my salvation. There is a sound of exultation and victory. In the, of the, the right hand of the Lord has triumphed. I shall not die, but live. And the, the Lord has punished me sorely. Open for me the gates of righteousness. This is the gate of the Lord. I will give thanks to you, for you answered me. The same stone which the builders rejected. This is the Lord's doing. On this day, the Lord has acted. Our second reading is from Corinthians. Now I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaim to you, which you in turn received, in which also you stand, through which also you are being saved. If you hold firmly to the message that I proclaim to you, unless you have come to believe in vain. For I hand it on to you as if first importance, what I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and that he buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the 12, then he appeared to more than five Hundred brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, last of all, as to one untimely born. He appeared also to me, for I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me has not been in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we have proclaimed and so you have come to believe. This is the word of the Lord.
The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes, but Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. The Gospel of the Lord. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. A happy Easter, everyone. It's good to be with you today. Um, for those of you who may not know much about the life of a bishop, let me just say I don't have a home church. I'm somewhere different every Sunday. In some dioceses, a bishop would have what's called a cathedral, which would be essentially a home church of the diocese. And I can tell you, we've got lots of congregations in this diocese that would love to be the cathedral. And I've said, no, we're, we're not going to have one. Um, but one of the things it means is that there isn't therefore not a place where I would naturally be on Christmas Eve or Easter Day or some of those special times when you'd normally stay home. And so this year I put an invitation out, and it worked that I've been able to be with congregations in this area, which has been wonderful to shorten my driving. But I, was, I, I would have been with um, the folks at St. Peter's Swansboro on Thursday. Didn't get there, but on Friday I was at St. Paul's in Beaufort. And then this morning I started with the folks at St. Um, Andrews, Moorhead City, with their sunlight service, sunrise service at uh, Trinity Center which is the first time I was able to get there. Didn't dress quite so formally then. 
um, and then for the 9 o'clock service, and now with you at 11. So i got to say my experience of Easter is probably close to what I enjoy it being. Lots of pomp and ceremony, lots of carefully rehearsed music, carefully decorated churches, lots of effort put into a celebration. And in each of the three services this morning, the space available largely filled. Um, each of us will have come to worship today with our own ideas about what to expect, what we would hope to experience, what we think Easter should be all about. Each of us will come with our own um, life situation, the things that are going on at home with family, friends, work, all of those things that affect and, and shape who we are and how we engage with the world. Each of us will be at probably some level of overwhelmed with the news that comes to us from every direction and how to make sense of that and how to stay friends with neighbors when we disagree about difficult things. Each of us comes to worship for Easter Sunday with different experiences about what Easter has been in the past and what makes worship through Holy Week and Easter important. Again, as a bishop who gets to travel from church to church, I realize that what is important and beloved tradition in one place may not even be recognized in another place that has its own beloved traditions. Each congregation finding its own way to express um, the good news of God's love in Jesus. Sandy and I are just getting to know our neighbors where we, uh, where we now live. Um, and I learned that our next door neighbors love praise band music. And we'll be worshiping with one of the congregations in the area that has a great big outdoor service. Um, full of energy and, and, and good music. I don't know that I'll have a chance to get there. It's probably not on my list of Episcopal churches. Um, but we all have our good experiences. We all have our ideas of what makes worship meaningful, powerful, important. Celebrations of Easter often include, especially children, but even all of us getting dressed up in fancy clothes, maybe new clothes, maybe matching clothes flowers that have been given often in memory of, of, of beloved family and friends. Um, like I say, all the hard work that goes into planning the liturgy, all of the people, musicians, clergy, lay leadership, office staff, the folks who clean our churches, the ones that run the soundboards, putting in extra time and effort. And I think that over the years, I've noticed once or twice when that busyness gets in the way for folks, of what might be at the heart of an Easter celebration. They're just so busy with all of the things that have to happen. And I'm just describing what happens at church, not, not even touching on what might happen in family homes, what might happen with travel. I want to offer you a suggestion this year, something you can take away that, if it makes sense for you, uh, will be really simple to remember. Three words that come from the reading that we've had from the Acts of the Apostles. And I think that in a particular way, they capture the essence of our Easter celebration. Three words, God raised him. Now I think if I was telling that story to others, I would say God raised Jesus and start from there. God raised Jesus. Those of us who have been following the events of Holy Week have learned about the last moments of the life of Jesus. Last Sunday, we would have heard the story, perhaps, of how Jesus entered the city of Jerusalem. Not as some powerful warrior on the back of a, uh, a large horse or in a chariot with armies on every side. That's probably how Pilate entered the city for the feast. But Jesus was on the back of a donkey. We hear that when he gathered with his friends for the meal on what was either the night he was arrested or... or a Different Gospels tell the story a little differently, perhaps the Passover feast, that as they got started in John's Gospel, we hear he got down onto his knees having taken off his outer clothing, and he washed the feet of his closest friends. Again, not the act of one who was trying to show off his own power, his own strength, but one who understood that God was calling him to be of service um, to those in his life. Jesus taught them as he washed their feet that as he has loved them, so they were to love one another. Later that evening, as he's in the garden praying, one of the Gospels tells the story that Jesus says that can be heard, Father, 
if you will, please take this cup from me. In other words, I don't want to die. I'm not eagerly anticipating what's ahead. Please, if you want to, let's, let's go a different way. Not my will, but yours, Jesus prayed. Think of those words from the Lord's Prayer, which we will say together a little bit later in worship. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth that is is in heaven. The way that Jesus taught his followers to pray and the way that we pray is to set our will to the side and to place God's will as a priority. God's will for Jesus was that he continued on that path. He drank the cup, as it were. The fact that his followers didn't even understand must have been a strain for him. Again, later in that evening when the soldiers came to arrest him and he was betrayed by one who had been close to him, uh, Peter uh, pulled out his sword and cut off the ear of one of the servants of the high priest. And Jesus basically said, not that way, not that way. My cup, my path does not include violence, does not include power over. It's as if, and I think we would have all kind of appreciated this, that Jesus being the righteous person he was could have risen up and used that power that was his from God to change the outcome of the events so that they could have happened in the way he would have preferred. Have any of you ever had one of those moments where you might have liked to rise up and change the course of human affairs and have things work out differently than they're happening? On Palm Sunday, when we entered Holy Week, we heard a reading from uh, Paul's letter to the Philippians in which he was trying to convince the people of his own time that they ought to follow the example of Jesus. It sounded from his writing as if the people were arguing each other with each other about who was right and, and whose will was the one that should be followed and how they should go ahead. Again, something we could probably understand from our own context. And what the apostle says to them is let you have the same mind in you as Christ Jesus and then went into a piece of poetry or an ancient hymn that said that Jesus, recognizing he actually had all of God's power, set that aside, and he emptied himself, giving up that power, giving up the possibility of fulfilling his own will and interest. He gave up the power. He emptied himself. He humbled himself, and he became obedient to death. Now, following Jesus for us does not mean we have to plan to be obedient to a death on a cross as that happened for Jesus, but we are called to be obedient for our whole life. We are called to be obedient not just today or not just when it's convenient, but from each day forward, knowing that when we fail, when we fall short, um, we can turn around and experience God's gracious forgiveness and carry on and get back on the path. The, the hymn doesn't end there. It speaks of Jesus' obedience even to death on a cross. And then it says, God raised him. Not quite like it does in the Acts of the Apostles, but essentially the same. In the end, the victory was God's. God did not allow Jesus' broken body to remain in the grave as a sign that the power of the Roman Empire had been successful. No. Jesus' body was gone when his followers arrived at the grave to care for it. The Gospels are full of wonderful stories of how it was the women who got there first and how largely the men didn't believe the women. Okay, no surprise. <laughs> the stories around the resurrection are powerful and have filled many sermons for many years, but I'm going to stay with the simple version. God raised him. God raised Jesus. And the good news, I think, for us in those three words is that not only did God raise Jesus, but God offers us that same resurrection. If we were to break into group, we were not going to do this. Don't get